the gap, standing for Jesus Standing in the gap for family and friends Standing in the gap, one love for all So we all can make it in Standing in the gap, standing for Jesus Standing in the gap for family and friends Standing in the gap One love for all So we all can make it in Studying to show ourselves approved Rightly divine the word of truth Increasing our faith to envision our freedom So we all can glorify our God Standing in the gap Standing for Jesus Standing in the gap for family and friends Standing in the gap One love for all So we all can make it in Make it in Make it in Make it in Want to hear him say good Good and faithful servant Wanna hear him say, enter into the joy of the Lord Wanna hear him say, good, good and faithful servant Wanna hear him say, enter into the joy of the Lord Wanna hear him say, good, good and faithful servant Wanna hear him say, enter into the joy of the Lord Wanna hear him say, good, good and faithful servant Wanna hear him say, to joy of love Wanna hear him say good Good and faithful servant Wanna hear him say Here to the joy of love Wanna hear him say good And good and faithful servant Wanna hear him say Here to the joy of love Of love Joy of love Love Joy of the Lord, of the Lord. All right, good morning, good morning. Welcome, welcome. And Happy New Year, I guess. Cause happy we, New Year. We've been away for a couple of weeks in a very, um, I mean, it was full of <laughs> things as uh, a lot of people uh, came down with this uh, uh Corona, or what is it, uh, COVID-19, um, and so we, uh, we, uh, quarantined, and, uh, we're ready to go, but, you know, if anybody can catch the, uh, I mean, if I can catch the, uh, COVID-19 with all the precautions I take, and that my wife takes, and, um, then anybody can, and as we know, this thing is marching on, and, Apparently, um, and, uh, evidence is that it's marching on, on the unvaccinated. So, you know, and, you know, we can, we can sit up and say, um, um, you should take the vaccine. You should do this. You should do that. But the evidence is clear. Evidence is clear. And people make, they're, they're making their choices. They can't say they didn't have enough information and all that. Um, they're making their choices. So. Uh, we praise God that we, we uh, uh, are blessed and we had all our vaccinations and boosters and that all we had were mild symptoms. So we want to thank God for that. But just to let you know, this is our Standing in the Gap, our Christian education ministry. I'm Art Harmon and along with my, my wife, Marvel, we present this Christian education ministry where we tackle some of the more controversial uh, issues in uh Christianity, and we have a catalog of, um, of, um, uh, of classes that we have online. You can check all those out, along with outlines and all that. We've been, for the last few weeks, uh, uh, in this uh, uh, standing in the gap, uh, the, the, the case for Christ. And God is not dead. It's actually God's not dead with the subtitle, The Case for Christ. And we, uh, 
what we have been tackling is the issue. Some people believe that God is uh, never existed, that he existed, that he was dead, or just, just not relevant in their lives. And so we tackle that, and we, we uh, do it by the way of proof. And we try to prove to you that God is not dead. We first did it from uh, the Bible perspective where it says that you don't, the evidence, you have all the evidence you need to know that God is real and God is, is um, the God of the universe by looking at creation. And so we, um, we, we uh, began the study from that angle where we, uh, and scientific, the Big Bang Theory and, and um, uh, all the aspects of, uh, of science, the quantum, quantum theory and, and um, all those things from, from the angle of creation to try to convince you that obviously, clearly, God is real. God is not dead. God is alive and and uh, important in our lives. However, we also took it from a different angle because in 1 John, uh, it talks about uh, in the beginning was the Word, the Word was with God, the Word was God, and later on says that the Word became flesh and dwelt among us. So if that's true, and we can prove that, what John is talking about, then we have proved that uh, 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 God is not dead in a different way. So that's what we've been doing. The second part of this uh, study is proving that the case for Christ, and we proved that as I would in a court of law. Some of you know I am an attorney. So I try to present evidence to you so that you can make your mind up and so, so that you're not just standing on, well, I just believe. That's great if you can just do that. But a lot of people can't. Dalton Thomas couldn't. As a matter of fact, the disciples after the, uh, after the crucifixion they need some proof. They need some evidence. So we try to present you proof. We present you experts. And we uh, delve deeply, deeply into the issue. Now, we have... Uh, well, let me do this. Before we get started, um, as always, we start out with a prayer. Our Father and our God, I want to thank you, Father, for delivering us through this... Uh, this pandemic, Father, even though we were, um, even though we did contract that uh, that virus, Father, I want to thank you because you never promised us that there wouldn't be t uh, turmoil and turbulence and bad times and all that. What you did promise is that you would be with us, that you would be protecting us. And so I want to thank you for that, Father. We have made it through. I want to uh, ask that you can bless all those out there who are doing their best not to contract it and, and spread it and all that. I'm going to put a head of protection around them, Father. And even those who are not doing what they're supposed to do, we, we, we pray that you protect them too, Father, even if it's just protecting them against themselves. So, Father, we ask for your blessings on those. We ask for your blessings on those who, who uh, are following us in this uh, ministry and standing in the gap, that gap that has been created between you and your people, Father, by those who want to ignore, ignore you, Father, ignore your your work in this world and all that, and draw his people away from you, creating a gap. You've asked for those who are willing to stand in that gap, Father, and we, we said uh, we will, we do, and hopefully this word, this ministry that um, that is, is coming here is acceptable in your sight, Father, and it's having the effect that you want it to have, Father. We ask for you to empower us and, and uh, uh, as we go down this road, as we finish up this study, Father, because we know that you are real and we want to thank you. So bless all those who are, who are able to follow us live here, uh, uh, those who review this uh, video at a later time, Father, fill them with your Holy Spirit of wisdom, power, and courage as we move on. And we thank you, Father. In the name of Christ, we pray. Amen. 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 And as uh, as always, I need to, uh, it's not just me doing this, uh, doing this ministry. This ministry would not be able to, to be presented if it wasn't for my better half, <laughs> the one that keeps us in Bless you. Thank you. <laughs> the one who keeps us on track and uh, keeps us on the airwaves. 
and make sure that she takes care of everything that is needed to be done other than me sitting up here doing the instructing. And that is my wife, Marvel. Marvel. Good morning, Saints. Good morning and Happy New Year. Um, in the chat box, there is a link. There are actually two links. Uh, one link to come in and join me here in my Facebook Live room. Right now, I'm just in here with Art. So come on in and join us in the Facebook Live room. Also, there's a link to the outlines. So you can get uh, the outline for today's class online or you can download it. Um, I'm excited to be back and looking forward to a wonderful 2022. All right. Thank you. And as we uh, get into the study here, I, I want everybody to always remember that. My God's not dead. He surely lies. He's living on the inside. Living on the inside and roaring like a lion. So that's that's that that always gets us started. Hopefully it gets you pumped up too, because it gets me pumped up. <laughs> All right. Well, I tell you what, we have come a long way in this study. Because as we've tried to present this evidence as we would in the court of law, we had two two things we uh we uh were inspired by, let's say that. One of them is uh that movie uh God's not dead, and I believe that, as I, like I said, there's a new edition coming out already out <coughs> of that. That got that kind of got me inspired to, to for this uh, study, but also a book written by Lee Strobel, which is called The Case for Christ, which uh, Lee Strobel is a um, investigative reporter, or that's what he was. And he he was basically an atheist. He didn't believe in uh, in God. Jesus and all that. His wife was a believer. So he wanted to prove to his wife that that's a bunch of bump. And so he used his investigative report skills. He's going through all the evidence. He's going to present it to her. And maybe she'll come along with him and and uh, put all this God and Jesus stuff to the side. And as he went through it, I mean, he went through it as a strong, uh, active atheist. He was trying to prove things and ended up proving that God is real. <laughs> And uh, supporting the case for Christ. He's not the only one. Marvel mentioned that last week as I was reviewing the uh, video from last week. That there were others who had gone down that road where they were atheists. And as they delved into it, they uh, became believers. And like I said, the um, you know some people can um, believe in their, and their faith is so strong. They don't need any any physical evidence because their belief is so strong. Everybody's not like that. And the Bible even recognizes that as I talked about doubting Thomas who had to get some evidence to show. He said, I'll believe it when I see. But also understand that as we get into this part of the study that um, the disciples after the uh, crucifixion needed some evidence too. And God was not reluctant to, to show it to them. So where, where have we been? Well, we uh, started with the uh, with what I call God's not dead, of course, but the case for Christ in this part of the section where, as I said, I'm a lawyer and I always bring my case in the court and I sit it on top of the, of the desk so everybody can see it and I, I ceremoniously open it up and I pull my file out. And in this case, I pull out the file, the Alpha and Omega file. You say, what is the Alpha and Omega file? Well, that's the uh, file that we have been following as we show you the proof, the evidence for the case for Christ. Eyewitness testimony. And eyewitnesses are right there in the first four books of the New Testament. The Gospels and even into the Acts of the Apostles. And the and the uh, writings of Paul, the uh, documentary evidence. We went into how the Bible was, uh, a New Testament was put together, the canons, and how you can rely upon what's documented in there. And uh, we 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 went through corroborating evidence uh, of uh, evidence outside of the Bible that's out in the world, the secular world that supports the Bible story. 
We uh, looked at it from a scientific uh, 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 angle, archaeology, where they keep digging in the ground, finding stuff, trying to disprove and come uh, and end up proving. And it, it falls in the line. We did not do rebuttal. We will save that to the end. Identity evidence. Uh, did Jesus think he was, uh, was God? The psychological evidence. If he thought he was God, the son of God or whatever, was he just crazy? And we went into that. We went into profile evidence, meaning he, he claimed to be the Messiah. The Messiah. But did he fit the profile of the Messiah? We went into that. And the fingerprint evidence is that, is this what is left behind truly evidence, evidence that Jesus was real, that Jesus died, that Jesus was raised? We went through the medical evidence because the Bible has a lot of information on there that, that could be deemed to be not accurate because at the time they wrote it, how would they know about all that, all, all that medical technology or information? And, and all they were saying was, this happened. This happened. For example, the uh, uh, blood and blood and water came out his side as they pierced him. Yeah, at the time, how would they, they wouldn't know that. They wouldn't know that. But the evidence from the, uh, from the uh, uh, sci uh, science says that, oh, yeah, that, that definitely could happen. Ooh, how would they know that? But it would. Um, circumstantial evidence, we'll take that next week. We, we talked about the missing body. You know, why we're missing body? Empty tomb. Empty tomb. Why is that important? It's all built upon that. He, 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 was, he was crucified. The medical evidence said that nobody survived crucifixion. He was dead. Some people think he didn't die. He just swooned and, you know, uh, recovered and went down over to India and got married had kids and all that. Um, he was definitely dead, and he was placed in a tomb. We went and we studied the evidence of of, of the tomb and how it was uh, sealed. How the how the Jews and the Romans wanted to make sure that nobody come and take his body because he had already said he was going to rise if you did that to him. And so they uh, made sure they made sure in their mind. They put guards in front of a big old stone and everything, and nobody can get through here. And then they come early Sunday morning, find out the body's gone. <laughs> Somebody came and got the body. <clears throat> now, there and 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 the important behind that was no, not the Jews, not the Romans, and not anybody has said that the tomb wasn't empty. They just have an explanation they claim for it. They could have easily said, no, here's the body. What are y'all talking about? They couldn't do it. So the missing body is the foundation of Christianity. If they had found a body in there, then you can forget about all this. But they didn't. Now we're going to say, okay, it's good that, that we know he died. We know he was placed in a tomb. We know the tomb was empty. But that, that doesn't seal the deal. Why? Because people need evidence. If you didn't have any evidence other than, than they're saying, we saw this angel and he said, uh, why are you looking for the living among the dead? He is risen, as he said. Well, if we stopped it there, then you have a whole bunch of people, that's just a mess. You know, we, yeah, I need more than that, okay? Just like Dalton Thomas needed. The disciples needed. And what is that embodied in? That's embodied in the appearances, the appearances that is all documented throughout the Gospels that Jesus was resurrected because, you know, uh, the resurrection was a physical resurrection. And therefore, you had to physically see him after knowing he was dead. And, and, and that sealed the deal for a lot of, a lot of people. Back then, the disciples and a lot of people in the area, the Jews, of course, who didn't really want to believe that. But the appearances are so important. And we're going to get into that today. Well, that's really the thing that emboldened the disciples because they had run scared mm -hmm. when Jesus got uh, crucified. But when they saw him resurrected, then they knew I have to believe, I have to testify, 
I have to, I have to do all of this mm -hmm. because I saw him. I saw him. And what, what, what else would turn people who were running scared and hiding and shaking in the boots and not wanting the Jews to know where they were or the Romans to know where they were to turn them around in such a short time where about three days later they're saying, oh, he's alive. He's not dead. We're not, we no longer need to be shaking in our boots and all that. We're going to stand up in front of you Jews and in front of you Romans and all that. What would turn somebody around that quickly other than they were convinced that he was alive. The appearances. That's what we're getting into today. The appearances. The empty tomb plus the appearances. Jesus' death, empty tomb plus appearances equals resurrection. Equals resurrection. So how important um, is the empty tomb? We already said it's the foundation in which the resurrection is built. How important are the appearances? To Christianity, well, as I said, they sealed the deal. They sealed the deal. You see, it was that way for the eleven. It was that way for Paul. It was that way for James. It was that way for the disciples on the Emmaus road. It was that way for the women who ran to the tomb to anoint his body. It was that way for five hundred. You see, we're talking about it sealed the deal for them. Why? What? The appearances. Why? Because they all saw it. They all saw him. Can we believe the Gospels and the book of Acts regarding these appearances? Well, that brings us to our expert. As I've done throughout this entire uh, study, I've not let you rely upon me. Although I have a certain amount of knowledge and all that, you're not going to believe me all the time. So I back it up as I would in the court of law with experts. Expert. And I present the expert to you, and I, I uh, report to you his expertise, and I offer him as an expert for you to rely upon. And this guy, Gary Habermas, he's, uh, he, he's, he's remarkable. He's probably the foremost authority on the resurrection, as a matter of fact. And uh, he, he has a lot of videos out there that you can uh, get on uh, YouTube. Matter of fact, I'm going to ask Marvel. Uh, to just start a, um, and I mean, she's done a little bit of already just to start a, a resource for everybody where we, uh, even though we may not show the videos uh, in the in the class, but you can go to and hit it and see. Because some of them are like 45 minutes or a half hour, and we don't really have time to, to do all that. And uh, one of the guys that I'm going to ask her to do is this Gary Habermas, because he is, he's remarkable. You need to hear him because he deals with facts. He deals with facts. And uh, he, he he debates atheists. And he he, he, he he routes them and all that based on facts. Facts that they can't disprove. And that's, and that's what a lot of people need. They, they need that. And so uh, Gary Habermas, I'm going to offer him as an expert right now for this particular study. Uh, he's reputed to be one of the world's foremost experts on the resurrection. Has a doctorate of divinity from Emmanuel College in Oxford, hmm, England. Distinguished professor uh, and chairman of the Department of Philosophy and Theology and director of the master's program in apologetics at Liberty University. Former president of the Evangelical Philosophical Society. Has written seven books dealing with Jesus rising from the dead. Written over 100 articles, which have appeared in popular publications, scholarly journals, and reference books. And as always, as always, I say, take a look. I offer him as an expert on the resurrection. And we will be using him as our um, protagonist. As we, we juxtapose the protagonist against the antagonist. Our antagonist is uh, Lee Strobel, the guy that wrote the book, The Case for Christ. Remember, he started out as an atheist, and after he, after he did all the investigation, he became a believer. But we're, we're, we're going to focus on him as he was an uh, atheist because he, he asked the right questions as an atheist uh, that atheists ask to, uh, and, and uh, uh, try to show that there is, there, there's no support for Jesus 
son of man, and God's son, and resurrection, and all that kind of thing. So as we go through this study, we're going to have our uh, expert and our, our antagonist go at it with each other, as we would in the court of law. Because we would, we would uh, cross-examine that expert. What are you talking about? And that's what we're doing here today. So that's uh, Gary Habermas offered as an expert. Okay. So what's the first question that our antagonist would come at? As, as atheists would come at you, and they said, well, isn't it true that there were eyewitnesses to, uh, there were uh, eyewitnesses to the resurrection? Were there eyewitnesses to the resurrection? Now understand, it, it, it can be kind of a trick question because he's not asking were there eyewitnesses to the appearances after the resurrection. The resurrection, if it occurred, occurred before the women ran to the to the tomb and it was empty and the angel said why are you looking for the for the a living among the dead he is risen so uh, the the resurrection itself happened before they discovered the empty tomb uh, so trouble said isn't it true there were no eyewitnesses to the resurrection our expert said true no one was sitting inside the tomb and saw Jesus rise up. Strobel says, doesn't this hurt attempts to prove that the resurrection is a historical event? Our expert says, no. Science is all about cause and effect. I, I thought that was really good when he said that because that's that, that is how they teach us in science, right? Yes. There's a cause and that causes a certain effect. And so, um, the effect is, is is resurrection. There's a cause for that to happen. That's the same thing we dealt with when we were talking about creation uh, in in the first part of the study. And we we backed it all the way down to the to the Big Bang theory, and and science says cause and effect. So what caused the Big Bang theory? It's a good study. If you get a chance, go back and look at that. Yeah, it's it, it's online. Um, did Jesus die on the cross? Well, we proved that. He did die. Did he later appear to the people? See, the death and the appearances go together. Prove those two things, that he died and that he later appeared to people and the case for the resurrection is made because dead people don't do that. <laughs> <laughs> Our antagonist says, uh, well, did Jesus really appear later? He said, uh, one thing about the uh, atheists, you know, they question everything. Mm -hmm. Everything. Mm -hmm. And what evidence is it that people actually saw him later on? Our expert says that virtually all critical scholars will admit that Paul wrote 1 Corinthians. And Paul affirmed in two places in 1 Corinthians that he personally encountered the resurrected Christ. He says, am I not an apostle? Have I not seen Jesus our Lord? 1 Corinthians 9.1. And last of all, he, and he says, uh, later on, last of all, he, after, after he appeared to all these people, he says, last of all, he appeared to me. 1 Corinthians 15.8. Let's look at that. 1 Corinthians, it's called the Corinthian Creed. Remember we talked about creeds so much? And that, that prior to the, to the uh, uh, Gospels being written, to the Book of Acts being written, prior to the letters that Paul wrote, and the letters, remember, came before the actual Gospels were written, Paul's letters. And then what did Paul rely upon in order to uh, put into his letters what is happening? So, Paul says and explains to you, he said, for what I received, I passed on to you as of first importance. That Christ died for our sin according to the scripture. That he was buried. That he was raised on the third day according to the scripture. And that he appeared to Cephas, and Cephas is Paul. I mean Peter. And then to the twelve. After that, he appeared to more than 500 
of the brothers and sisters at the same time, most of whom are still living, though some have fallen asleep. Then he appeared to James, the brother of Jesus, then to all the apostles. And last of all, he appeared to me also as one abnormally born. So when people, people say, well, okay, I, I, I believe Paul wrote all these things. And then there's evidence, and, and when you watch some of those Habermas videos, you'll see that this creed that is being is set forth in uh, 1 Corinthians 15 was uh, goes back to within weeks of the resurrection, weeks of the crucifixion. There was no uh, no time for legend to creep in. The, this creed is what uh, the Christians who were you know, being persecuted and all that. This is what they were chanting and believing within weeks of the, the crucifixion. All right, would you just take a minute? When you say creed, what do, what does creed mean? You probably have encountered it at your churches. Because, see, what what is easy, it's, 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 it's like a song. Why? Because even even your kids, they, they, uh, uh, listen to rap songs and all that, and and the way they can remember those, though every word of those rap songs and all that, because it has a little, it, it it has a beat, you know, and and all that, and so in uh, nothing was written down, and so as the Christians got together, they 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 chanted things and they put in their in 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 their chants what they believed in, which became the creed. The earliest evidence of the belief of the Christians, and so within weeks of the of, of the crucifixion, when they gathered at their homes, remember there were no churches and everything. They gathered at their homes, gathered together as Christians, now believing in Christ. This is what they said, and this what is what is passed on to Paul, and then actually written down in Paul's letters. Remember this Corinth. Letters printed was before the Gospels, okay? So you're trying to say, well, they just made it up in the Gospels. Uh-uh, here you go. Here are the letters. And Paul's saying, I didn't make it up in the letter. It was passed on to me as a first importance, and I passed it on to you. Does that answer the question? Yes, thank you. Thank you. Just um, You know, sometimes when we're in the study, and I mean, you've explained creeds before, but you know, when you just keep saying the Corinthian creed and creed, creed, and, the, and people are listening and watching and they're like, well, I hear him saying that, but what exactly is it? But what it really is, is when the people witnessed, then when they got together, just like we sing, thank you, Lord. And little kids know that. Mm -hmm. Little kids know that. And so that's what they were doing. And that's how they passed that historical information down through the time. And it happened so quickly after uh, uh, the crucifixion and resurrection that they didn't have they didn't have time to make it up. Mm -hmm. They just saying what they saw. Mm -hmm. And 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 when you look at this creed and there are other creeds that are in 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 the Bible in Scripture, this might be the most important one because why it names specific individuals. Mm. It, groups of people are named, and doubters could actually go and say. Talk to those people and verify what is being said to confirm the facts. Now, our antagonist says, okay, well, how trustworthy is this creed? Now, how far does it go back? And how do we know it's a creed? You know, at least three of our experts that I have presented in this study are in agreement that this is a creed of the early church. But our expert says first. Paul introduced it with technical rabbinic terms indicating he was passing along holy tradition. Remember, they were Jews. So when you when you had to talk to Jews, you had to talk in like rabbinic terms for them to 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 uh, put any uh, trust in it or whatever. So he he didn't talk about it just in as you and I might talk. You know, he talked about it in the way that they can understand. Secondly. The parallelisms and stylized content of the text in, indicates it is a creed. Remember, I said that the the way it, you can you can chant it and with the rhythm and all that, almost like a rap song. 
This might have been the first rap song. Who knows? <laughs> <laughs> the original text used the name Cephas for Peter, which is an Aramaic name. It said Cephas. Aramaic name. The use of Aramaic, uh, Aramaic indicates its origin is in the very early church. Why? Because you look at the uh, uh, Gospels and they're in what language? Uh, Greek. Greek. Yeah. And this is talking in the way the uh, Jesus talked. I was going to say, yeah. Jesus spoke Aramaic, exactly. right? Exactly. Mm -hmm. And all those Jews talked. Fourth, this creed uses several other primitive phrases that Paul would not customarily use, like the twelve, the third day. He was raised. And fifth, the use of certain words is similar to Aramaic and what's called the Mishanaic Hebrew means of narr narration, meaning that's how they talk. That's how they talk back then. It wouldn't, wouldn't it be something if he said the creed was uh, uh, the way we talk today? That would that would that would put a lot of uh, fuel on these uh, atheists or argument. No, but it's in the way that they talk back then. That gives it a lot of uh, support. And the fact that it is a creed is shared by a wide range of scholars across a broad theological spectrum, both believers and atheists. Strobel say, well, okay then, uh, how far can you date it back? How far can you date it back? You say this happened so, so quickly. Archbishop says, Paul wrote 1 Corinthians between A.D., 55 and 57. He indicated at the time that he had already passed on this creed to the church at Corinth. And you talk about 1 Corinthians 15, 1, 4, which says, Now, brothers and sisters, I want to remind you of the gospel I preached to you, and I already preached this to you, which you received and on which you have taken your stand. So they had already received it, they understood it, all this. By this gospel you are saved. If you hold firmly to the word, I preach to you. Otherwise, you have believed in vain. Then he says it again. For what I received, I passed on to you as of first importance that Christ died for our sins, according to the scriptures, that he was buried, that he was raised on the third day, according to the scriptures. This is what, this is what was being taught. This is what was taught to to Paul. Where did Paul get it from? We'll get into that. You see, this indicates that it must predate his first visit to Corinth in 51 AD, which proves the creed was being used within 20 years of the resurrection. Remember, 51 is just 20 years from the resurrection. And this is very early um, by historical standards. Because you can, you can go back to all that uh, ancient uh, 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 books and, and and facts or what people think is fact and find out that uh, whenever that fact occur originally occurred, it wasn't written down for thousands of years or hundreds of years. And this is 20 years. A number of scholars trace it back even earlier to two to eight years after the resurrection, 32 to 38 A.D. And this is when Paul received it in either Damascus or Jerusalem. Paul received it very, very uh, close. And year, six, eight years is close by historical standards. So what you're saying is that he got blinded on, on Damascus. He went to that inn. Yeah. That's what I meant on the Damascus road. That's yeah. what I meant on the Damascus road. He went to that inn. The scales came off of his eyes, and they started teaching him then. But then he went back to Jerusalem, didn't he? He went into and, the desert and studied, and uh, then before and then, he went to Jerusalem. Oh, okay. And, but then and he met went, up with the other apostles. Okay. Mm -hmm. And so this is when it was handed to him. And you you, you got ahead of us a little bit, but it's oh, good. sorry. No problem. It's good because <laughs> that's exactly what I was about to get into. Okay. I'm um, a straight lady. See, this is when Paul received it in either Damascus or Jerusalem. 
after his Damascus Road experience or his visit to Jerusalem with Peter and James. And this is incredibly early material, primitive, unadorned material that he received. Strobel said, but isn't Paul simply providing second or third hand information? Doesn't this diminish the value of the evidence when it's second and third uh, hand information? Strobel said, I mean, uh, our, uh, our expert, Gary Haberman, says no. Because for one thing, Paul affirms that Jesus appeared to him also. So that's not, that's first hand information. Uh, the leading view of all the scholars who study this is that he got it directly from the eyewitnesses. Well, who would that be? Peter and James. He got it. Remember, I, I left the question. I said, where did, where, did, where did Paul get it from? He got it. He says, I got it, and I gave it to you before I wrote 1 Corinthians 15. The question is, where did he get it from? All right. And let's go to some more scripture. Galatians. See, you know, when you're studying uh, when you're studying this, a lot of times you have to take a road through the scripture and not just rely upon what you think and all that. Go back to the scripture. See if there's any support for what is being said. Galatians 1, 13 to 20. For you have heard of my previous way of life in Judaism, how intensely I persecuted the church of God and tried to destroy it. I was advancing in Judaism beyond many of my own age among my people, and I was extremely zealous for the tradition of my father. But when God, who set me apart from my mother's womb and called me by his grace, was pleased to reveal his son in me so that I might preach him among the Gentiles, my immediate response was not to consult any human being. I did not go up to Jerusalem to see those who were apostles before I was. But I went to Arabia, and later I returned to Damascus. That answer your question. After he got, uh, after Jesus appeared to him on the road to Damascus, he went to Arabia. Arabia, you know? Desert. It's the desert. <laughs> <laughs> and a lot of people go out to the desert and, and separate themselves from the world so that they can get what they feel is true meaning without the interference of the world. They went out to Arabia and actually studied under somebody called Gamiel. And later he returned to Damascus. Now, then after three years, I went up to Jerusalem to get acquainted with Cephas. Well, remember he said Cephas again. Peter. And stayed with him 15 days. There it is. Within a matter of years, he's there with Peter. And Peter has to be the number one apostle, number one zealous uh, supporter of Jesus, the one who testifies that he saw Jesus at the appearance afterward. His whole life changed because he had basically turned his back on Jesus. And that he saw him, and not only saw him, he saw him in physical form. He touched him. He, he ate with him. They fellowship together. And Paul is getting this from Cephas. Stay with him 15 days. I saw none of the other apostles, only James, the Lord's brother. See, that's another one. See, you got these people who either were skeptics, or who, who were believers and but then lost their faith and now they're back again. Why? Because he appeared to them. He appeared to them. He says, I assure you before God that what I am writing to you is no lie. See, this trip is, is described in um, Galatians where it uses the Greek word historio. In you know, we, we see this in English, but they're translating it from Greek. And in the Greek, the word historical is used, which means that he was on an investigative inquiry when he went up to talk to to uh, 
Peter and talk to James within three years. So, Paul emphasizes that the other apostles agreed in preaching the same gospel, and, and that's one of the things he wanted to do. I'm out here preaching. I am, I'm, I'm as one that normally born because I wasn't one of the twelve, okay? I saw Jesus afterward. He, he appeared to me afterwards. And so I'm, I'm on my way to go out here and preach this word because I feel like it's my duty to preach this to the Gentiles. And without, before I go running out there preaching, let me go talk to the ones who was right there, who, who touched him, who walked with him all that time, to make sure that the gospel that I am preaching is not different from the gospel they pre understand, they understand, and that they're preaching. Because that would be pretty horrible, wouldn't it? For, uh, for Paul to go out among all the Gentiles and preach something that's incorrect that conflicts with what the with 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 what the stars the superstars who knew it were preaching okay see and what and what all this means is that uh Paul's testimony and preaching is exactly the same as the preaching of the eyewitnesses themselves so let's take a look at the uh, Corinthian Creed timeline. The Apostle Paul. Corinthians written by Paul in 55 to 57 AD. Paul first came to Corinth in 51 AD. The trip to Jerusalem to visit Peter and James was around 35 to 37. The Damascus Road experience was 33 to 34. Uh, two years or, or, you know, average two years after resurrection, crucifixion of Christ. 30 to 31. And some people move those time limits. I mean, it's hard for them, you know, uh, to get the dates. But back then, nobody was writing down uh, Christianity. The Jews weren't allowing you to do anything with it. The Romans weren't having it. And so, the best we can say is that it happened, the crucifixion, 30 to 31. Paul got his experience after he was persecuting the church for a couple of years on uh, 33 to 34, and he took his trip to Jerusalem after going to Arabia and talked to Peter and James, and then passed it on to the people in Corinth in 51 AD. A actually passed it on before that, but it's written down in the letter, 51 AD. Uh, in 55 to 57 is when, I'm sorry, when the Corinthians was written down. He refers to it when he first came to Corinth, 51 AD, but it didn't get written down in 55. That is 20, 22 years after the resurrection. So close in terms of history to when it happened that you can trust they didn't have time for legend to creep in and make up stuff and all that. They were just still reacting to what they saw, and all the people who were still alive who experienced it during that time. All right, well, let's talk about something that he talks about here. And I call it the mystery of the 500. And this is, this is, this is very, very important and very, um, you wonder how uh, Christianity survived because you had Jews and Romans trying to stamp it out and all that. And if he had only appeared to 11 people, Maybe they would have stamped it out because nobody else saw it. But the Bible tells us about something else. Now, our antagonist says the only place uh, 500 people Jesus appeared to. That's what the scripture says. Trouble says the only place where 500 are mentioned is in the Corinthian Creed. The Gospels don't mention it. No secular historian mentions it. If this really happened, why doesn't anyone else talk about it? None of the apostles except Paul mentions it. Our expert says it is silly to cast doubt on Paul as a valuable source. And, and basically what he's saying is that you guys, you, you, you guys really mess up when you're trying to uh, say that Paul don't know what he's talking about. <laughs> <laughs> 
he is, most scholars believe that Paul knew exactly what he was talking about, that he wrote these things, that he believed these things. He says, um, first, the source it is quoted in is the earliest and best authenticated passage of all, and that's the one we just talked about, which is the Corinthian Creed. Second, Paul had some proximity to the people, the 500 that he talked about. He says, most are still living, while some have passed. One would only use this phrase if they were absolutely confident in the truth of what they were saying. If, if somebody had the nerve to go contact those people and ask them about it, you wouldn't say that they're still living, you can go talk to them if you knew they weren't going to support what you said. Exactly. Paul's basically saying this. If you don't believe me, go talk to them yourself. And third, is a legitimate question as to why there aren't more sources mentioned in the 500, but that in and of itself doesn't destroy the credibility of the source. Of the source. You know what? And I thought about that. And I said, you know, we're lucky to have the uh, stuff that we have. You know? He said, why aren't more people uh, writing it down and all that? We're lucky to have what is written down right now anyway. Because why? Well, there weren't any printing presses. And remember, you got some people trying to find people who are saying this, you know, and do bad things to them. So what are, what, what are those people who saw that and all that? They ain't going down into the, uh, into the tabernacle or to the... Uh, uh, in front of the Jewish council and all that, saying, yeah, I saw him. He was talking to me and all that. And they start, they start uh, uh, kneeling the cross together. <laughs> and gathering up their stones. Right. I mean, <laughs> we have to put this in context, you know. You don't walk up into the synagogue who, who, has, just, who has just orchestrated the uh, crucifixion of Christ and, and, and uh, say all these things. You don't do that. You don't write it down. Nothing. They say, well, why aren't more people talking about that? Put it in context. Okay? So, um, Strobel said, okay, uh, <clears throat> no, no, Habernas says, uh, I'm sorry, Strobel says, where could such a, a large gathering have even taken place? 500 people. And Habermas says, well, possibly on the uh, Galilean countryside. Matthew says Jesus appeared to the eleven on the hillside. So maybe more than the disciples were present at that time. Strobel says, why wouldn't Josephus have reported? Remember we talked about Josephus? He, Josephus was a Jewish historian who actually had uh, was a traitor. Uh, when the Romans came and destroyed the temple and all that, and, and there was a Jewish war where they they uh, mercilessly uh, put it down and all that, and instead of uh, being slaughtered or whatever, Josephus thought it was better that he um, switched sides. But he became a historian, and he was a Jewish historian. Okay, he wasn't a Christian at all, and he wrote some things about Jesus and all that. <clears throat> but our expert says, if there were 500 people that Jesus appeared to, why didn't Josephus report it? And uh, our, our expert says, maybe he didn't know of it. <laughs> or chose not to, uh, to leave it out because he was not a follower of Jesus, remember. And it wasn't his, his goal to support what Jesus' uh, uh, legacy was. He was, he was a historian. And he was Jewish. And remember, Jews weren't supporting what Jesus said. So he wasn't going to say, well, yeah, there were 500 people that saw him afterward. Not going to do that. Strobel says, uh, the creed says Jesus appeared first to Peter, while John says he first appeared to Mary Magdalene. The creed does not mention any women. Aren't those contradictions that lessen the authenticity of the creed? Earthbird says the creed does not say he first appeared to Peter. It simply puts Peter's name first on the list. And women were not considered competent witnesses. So that's probably the reason why their name didn't appear in there. They're trying to convince people 
of what this is happening. And all the skeptics are going to try to hang on to something that they know is right. And they'll say, well, the women said all this. Oh, I ain't believing them. <laughs> Put it in context. Put it in context. And our expert says, after all of, of Strobel's questioning, the following remains untouched. Meaning he had all these, and atheists do, they have all these questions where they try to chip away at stuff on the edges and all that. But what they do <coughs> when they chip away on the edges, they leave the basics untouched. The creed is early. It's untouched. That the creed is early. It's free from legendary con uh, contamination. It is unambiguous and it is specific. And it's rooted in eyewitness accounts. No matter what, what, what Strobel said, no matter what all the atheists say, those are things that they can't touch in their argument. The creed is early. Free from legendary con contamination, unambiguous and specific, rooted in eyewitness accounts. So let's, let's move on. The testimony of the gospel appearances. Our antagonist Strobel says, describe the post-resurrection appearances in the gospel. Let's, let's, let's see what it says. Our expert says there are several different appearances to a lot of different people in the gospels and in the acts of the apostles. Some individually, some in groups, sometimes indoors, sometimes outdoors. To soft-hearted people like John and to skeptical people like Thomas. There were physical appearances that occurred over weeks. And what else? Let's look at the appearances here. These are the appearances that you can find in the gospel. Mary Magdalene, John 20, 10 to 18. To the other women, Matthew 28, 8 to 10. Cleophas and another disciple on the road to Emmaus. Luke 24, 13, 32. Eleven disciples and others in Luke 24, 33 to 49. Appearance to ten apostles and others with Thomas absent, John 20, 19, 23. Remember, the reason Thomas said, I need to see it for myself, is because when Jesus first appeared, Thomas was somewhere else. <laughs> um, to seven apostles, John 21, 1 to 14. To the disciples, Matthew 28, 16, 20. Jesus was, was with the apostles at the Mount of Olives before his ascension. Luke 24, 50 and 52 and Acts 1, 4, 9. Those are just some of them. Um, and of these, several are based on especially early material. Jesus' encounter with the women. Meeting with the eleven when he gave them the Great Commission. His meeting with the disciples in John 20, 19, 23 when he showed them his hands and showed them his feet. Early. In Book of Acts appeared, Acts appeared. He not only appeared in the Gospels. Remember, the Gospels uh, were, the, were the first four books, but a lot of things are revealed in the Acts of the Apostles. Jesus' appearances are mentioned regularly with detail, provided in almost every context the theme of the disciples being witnesses is found. In every context, it is that the disciples were the witnesses. And you find that in the Book of Acts. A number of accounts in Acts 1 to 5, 10, and 13 also include some, some creeds. Hmm. And report some very early data about the death and resurrection of Jesus. See the early sermons contained in the book of Acts, which preserve material from very early sources. So if you go to the book, the book of Acts basically starts right after the after the crucifixion and 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 is tells us about the formation of the early church so when you look at that you see certain creeds in there you see certain sermons in there and it what's it talk about resurrection resurrection see acts is littered with res, with um, references to jesus's appearance appearances see peter was adamant about it acts 2 32, he said, God has raised this Jesus to life, and we are all witnesses to it. Acts 3.15, you killed the author of life, but God raised him from the dead. We are witnesses of this, it says. Acts 10.41, 
Peter, now there's something in your uh, outline. If you got the outline, there was a mistake in there because it refers to Paul saying this on uh, Acts 10, 41. It was actually Peter. So just make a note of that. And it confirms to Cornelius. Remember, Cornelius was the Roman uh, 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 center, uh, uh, guard or whatever. Peter talking to Cornelius and others, he says, ate and drank with him. That He said, I ate and drank with him after he rose from the dead. <coughs> now, some people say, isn't he really talking about this as like a spiritual resurrection? Not a physical resurrection. He actually ate with them and talked with them and they touched him physically and all that. He said, isn't it really uh, better to think of this as a spiritual resurrection? I believe that the Bible says that Jesus ate and drank with them so that nobody would be confused that this was physical and not spiritual. Mm -hmm. Acts 13 31 says for many days he was seen by those who traveled with him from Galilee to Jerusalem they are now his witnesses to our people <laughs> Jesus was walking with them traveling with them eating with them joking with them encouraging them because this was the church that he was you know upon this rock I build my church so he knew that they needed a little support so he stayed with them for a long time. Appeared to many people. That's why the roots of this church were able to survive. Remember we talked about uh, 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 when you uh, throw seeds on uh, uh, rocky ground and thorny ground and all that. It doesn't get a chance for the roots to take. And uh, you need strong roots. In order for what's going to grow on top of it, the strong roots was Jesus himself appearing to these people, talking with them, eating with them, encouraging them, and then them seeing him rising up and all that. Uh, yeah, that's strong roots. <laughs> 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 now, our antagonist said, let me bring up this. He says, Mark's missing conclusion. Say, what do you mean by that? Say, the early manuscripts of, of the Gospels, Mark's Gospel. He said, don't have in them Mark 16, 9 to 20. It appears in later manuscripts. And most scholars believe that Mark ends at 16, 8. Chapter 16, verse 8. Not the 9 to 20. 9 to 20 talk about appearances. It ends at 8, and so they're saying that if it ends at 8, this means that Mark does not report any post-resurrection appearances. And he asks our expert, isn't that disturbing? <laughs> our expert says, well, first off, all don't believe that Mark stopped at 16, 8. But if it does, it still reports certain things that you can't deny. What is that? reports that the tomb was empty. A young man at the tomb proclaiming he is risen. That sounds like a, a resurrection. <laughs> and to nail it down, this young man, who was an angel, of course, telling the women that there will be appearances. Go If you go take a look at it, it says that he will appear to you. And he says, well, but it doesn't talk about those actual appearances down the road if you stop it at 16.8. Look, okay, fine. It still talks about appearances. It talks about resurrection and all that. You can't deny that. You can't deny that. And he says that um, clearly Mark believes that the resurrection took place and there will be appearances because he put that in his book. Now, what if, are there any alternative um Explanation for the appearances of Jesus. Strobel, our antagonist, says uh, the appearances are just legendary. They're just legendary. Um, well, you know, that, that's that's one thing all the atheists come out and say. All that stuff is just legendary, made up stuff, added into it, and all that. He says, and since Mark 
ends before the report of many appearances. Isn't it possible that evolutionary development exists in the Bible? Mark has no appearances, and it's the first gospel. Matthew has some. Luke has more. John has the most. Doesn't that mean that the appearances are merely legends that grew up over time? Our expert said, uh, nope. <laughs> First, not everyone believes that Mark is the earliest gospel. Hmm. Some believe Matthew was first. Second, legend only tells you how a story got bigger. It can't tell you how the story began. It can't explain the initial eyewitness accounts. They, it just can't. It can't tell you how the story originated when the participants are both eyewitnesses and reported the events very, 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 very early. The Corinthian Creed predates all the Gospels, and it makes huge claims about the appearances. And what about the empty tomb? You see, when legend enters into a story after a long time, usually hundreds of years and all that, why? Because everybody who was there and eyewitness are now dead. Now everybody after that start adding stuff to it and all that. That's why it's so important that this got written down so early. So early that no legend is in there. And plus, we have we have uh, information that goes back to within years of it happening. All right. Well, maybe according to Strobel, well, maybe the appearances were just hallucinations. <laughs> our expert says, our previous expert, and uh, we had talked about uh, Gary Collins had destroyed this theory. Uh, hallucinations are individual occurrences. I hallucinate in my head. I don't hallucinate in your head. Hallucinations, only one person can see it at one time. They cannot be seen by a group of people. Some people think about group hallucination. One person cannot somehow induce a hallucination on somebody else. We know that now. That's, that's pretty clear. People hallucinate in themselves. There are repeated accounts of Jesus appearing to multiple people who report the same thing. The disciples were not good candidates for mass hallucinations. They were hard-headed and skeptical. Remember that. See, people don't, don't put stuff in context. I'm having trouble believing all this. I don't know. And now all of them say, we believe. <laughs> <laughs> I don't think so. Um, hallucinations are relatively rare and are usually caused by drugs or some type of bodily deprivation. I know that because I do a lot of work in the mental health uh, area. And I see a lot of people who have suffered from hallucination or ongoing hallucination. And, and it's a mental illness for them. But it's individual. Or they, they've done drugs or something like that that destroyed their brain. Or they, you know, you, you can even have it by just drinking too much, you know. But, you know, one thing about it, it's a, it's a hallucination. You can't eat and drink with a hallucination. It doesn't, it doesn't. <laughs> Not for group study. Strobel says, well, could it have been some 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 type of group think? Have you ever heard of group think? Mm -hmm. um, Wikipedia defines group think as a psychological phenomenon that occurs within a group of people in which they the desire for harmony or conformity in the group results in an irrational or dysfunctional decision making outcome. QAnon. <laughs> that's, that's a good example of it. I mean, they get together and 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 now they'll say, what are they saying? QAnon is saying crazy stuff. John, John Kennedy and John Kennedy Jr. and all them are going to appear back because they aren't really dead and all that kind of thing. And uh, so I'm going to, I'm going to spend money, get on a flight and go down to Dallas and I'm just going to wait and wait and wait and wait and wait. And after somebody walks by, I say, uh, are you still here? Uh, <laughs> and, and they already missed a couple of dates with them. Of course. They missed a couple of dates with them, but they got a, a good reason 
Mm-hmm. That's irrational. a good. That's a good example of irrational uh, groupthink. Dysfunctional decision making, where people say that the uh, the election was fraudulent and all that. Okay, and you pin them down. Okay, what's your evidence of it? Uh, Fox News. <laughs> <laughs> because all the courts said no. I don't. I don't care what. You say over here, I believe it was fraudulent, and that's where I'm standing. Okay. So, group think, huh? Well, um, this, of course, this is where people talk to each other, talk each other into seeing things or something that don't exist. You know, one expert said that a, that a person full of religious zeal may see what he or she wants to see, not what is basically true. Our expert said. Resurrection was the center of their faith, and there was too much at stake. Groupthink is not a hallucination. The apostles and disciples went to their death defending it. Some would have rethought it before it got to that point, obviously. James didn't believe in Jesus, and Paul persecuted the church. Remember, keep that in context. See, people just take stuff out of context. How would they have been talked into seeing something that, that wasn't there? What about the empty tomb? What about the Corinthian Creed and other passages? The eyewitnesses were convinced that they saw Jesus alive and went to their death believing that. How many of you would go to your death with something you knew wasn't right, wasn't, wasn't true? Not many. Not many. I don't know anybody. To be true. Well, crazy people and, and conspiracy theorists do it. Go to their deaths? Some of them, yes. You know, well, that's... Crazy people, I'll go with you. Yeah. But even conspiracy theorists, <laughs> yeah, back it's off like of that. It's, it's like, well, I don't really believe all that nah. when it comes down to my life or my death. You say, did you really think I believed that? I didn't believe that. <laughs> so, in conclusion today, what is it that we have proven here today? Well, let's see. That Jesus was killed on the cross. Tomb was empty on Easter morning. Disciples and others saw him, touched him, ate with him after the resurrection. The appearances of Jesus are well authenticated as as well authenticated as anything else in antiquity and even more so. The early Christians were sure. They, they, it, it wasn't that they were kind of sure. They kind of thought they were sure of the resurrection because the appearances. They saw him. And they knew it was him. One other reason to believe in the resurrection? Let me let me throw this out to all of you. If Jesus was raised, then my mother was raised, and I'll be raised also. Then I will see them. I will see uh, Jesus. I'll see my mother and all the other family members that I can't wait to see again. All right, now, uh, I'm asking Marvel to queue up a uh, video for you as the last thing we do today from our friend, Reverend Parr. Today I'm going to give you five undeniable reasons why you must believe in the resurrection of Jesus Christ. That's coming up next on The Beat. Hey everyone, my name is Alan Parr. Thank you all so much for tuning into The Beat. Today we want to ask the question, how can we know for sure that Jesus Christ really did rise from the dead? I mean, is this just some myth or some clever fable that a group of people made up that has trickled down throughout history that we have just been told to believe? Or is there some evidence or some proof that this is really indeed the truth? And so today I want to give you five undeniable reasons why you must believe in the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Reason number one is because of the precautions of the Romans. Now you must understand that the Romans started hearing rumors that the disciples were going to come and steal the body of Jesus Christ away and say that he rose from the dead. And so in order to prevent this from happening, they did three things. First of all, they put what's called a guard around the tomb. And a guard was nothing more than a group of 10 to 30 soldiers who were highly trained to protect this tomb and guard it with their lives. The second thing they did was they put a stone 
around the opening of the tomb, and this stone weighed somewhere close to three or 4,000 pounds, and so this hindered anybody who wanted to come in or get out. And then the third thing they did is actually put a Roman seal around this stone such that if anyone tampered with or broke this seal, they were punished by death. So to suggest as some would that the disciples broke in and stole the body of Jesus Christ and claimed that he rose from the dead would be highly unlikely because here is a group of fishermen and tax collectors and the Bible says shortly before Jesus was crucified that all of them were terrified and afraid and forsook Jesus and ran for their lives and to think that this fearful group somehow got enough courage to break through a group of highly trained soldiers and steal the body of Jesus Christ is highly unlikely. The second reason is because of the faith of the disciples. We have to consider once again that right before Jesus was crucified, this group of disciples were cowards. But as soon as he rose from the dead, they all of a sudden turned into fearless preachers who were ready and willing to be beaten burned, beheaded, sawed into two, stoned, crucified, and even being willing to risk their very lives. So the question we have to ask is why would this group of people be willing to risk their very lives for something they knew deep in their hearts was nothing more than a lie? The third reason is because of Jesus' post-resurrection appearances. Perhaps one of the most convincing proofs is the fact that the Bible says that after his suffering, he gave many convincing proofs that he was alive and he appeared to them over a period of 40 days. The Apostle Paul goes on to say that at one time, Jesus appeared to over 500 people at one time, so much so that when he was writing this letter, he essentially told his readers, hey, if you don't believe me, you don't have to take my word for it. Go and speak to the people who saw them for themselves because most of them are still alive today. So to say that Jesus really didn't rise from the dead would suggest that all of these hundreds of people were either crazy or hallucinating, which is highly unlikely. Reason number four is that secular history confirms it. Now it would be one thing if the Bible was the only book that recorded the miracle of the resurrection, but other secular history books record the same thing. First of all, it's recorded by a man named Josephus who was a Jewish non-Christian historian. Second of all, it was recorded by a man named Thomas Arnold who wrote the history of Rome. What makes these testimonies even stronger is that they were written by non-Christians who were simply seeking to be credible and trustworthy historians, which means they had to report the truth whether they liked it or not. More recently, people like Frank Morrison, Lee Strobel, and Josh McDowell, all professed atheists, sought out to disprove the reality of the resurrection, thus proving that Christianity was nothing more than a false religion based on a myth. But as they dug into it and researched it more and more, they found that it was the undeniable truth and eventually all of them converted over to Christianity. And reason number five was that the missing body of Jesus Christ was never found. If Jesus never rose from the dead, then that means that his body would have still been in the grave, which means that all the Romans needed to do was simply reproduce the body of Jesus Christ, and then they would have settled the lie that Jesus rose from the dead, thus destroying Christianity forever. But the very fact that they could not reproduce the body is proof in and of itself that this miraculous event did occur in history. So guys, I hope this video not only gives you more confidence about what you believe as a Christian, but also gives you more ammunition to silence those who are skeptical about the Christian faith. If you found this video helpful in any way, feel free to share it with a friend. All right, I'm sorry. <laughs> I was checking on something. Um, I think that's all we have for today. Um, and I hope that the um, it's been helpful to you. We are we are really down the road on this thing, and we're going to get into um, I guess it will be the circumstantial evidence is the next thing. Yeah, I believe that's what it is. Um, let's see here, there we go. Circumstantial evidence next week. What's circumstantial evidence? Well, you have direct evidence and circumstantial evidence, and they're both are are evidence that we use in a court of law to determine uh, truth. And you can definitely be convicted of crime based on circumstantial evidence. So in our case for Christ, we're going to show you that circumstantial evidence. We're going to show it to you, to you next week. And so, Marvel, you got anything before we uh, close out? Well, I just want to remind people, check back on this post in this live post after we get off the air 
uh, I will put some of these uh, resource links of uh, videos that you can see uh, on your own. <clears throat> All right. All right. Thank you. Thank you for everybody that, uh, that uh, showed up. And we will continue with this uh, study. God is not dead. Let me see if I can enforce that with you. Uh, guess not. Oh, it's not going to play? <laughs> <laughs> oh, well. <laughs> oh, my God's not dead. He's surely alive. He's living on the inside. Going like a liar. God's not dead. He is surely alive. And we ended up always with a prayer. As we proceed from, from uh, this study of the appearances to... The next study, I think we have probably two more weeks of this, and then we're going to uh, uh, transpose into a study, another study that um, I, I really enjoy that um, uh, we're going to do. It's called Angels and Demons. Spirit world. See, a lot of people don't believe in the spirit world. Well, you have to believe in the spirit world to believe in Christianity. And, and so... You know, as I showed you the facts of uh, God's not dead and all that, this is really, I guess, another sub part of it because we're going to show you and prove to you the spirit world. Angels and demons are real. Do you believe that? Let us pray. Our Father and our God, we want to thank you, Father, for this study that you've given to us, the facts you've given us, things we can hold on to, Father, as to the resurrection as to the appearances to justify our faith father and 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 and, and our hope father and, and we just thank you for for what you've given to us we ask you to keep our minds clear so we can accept this evidence father and others can accept this evidence father to give them a chance at eternal life father because within this study within with with within what we're we've been teaching are the keys to eternal life. So Father, we just ask that you open our hearts, open our minds, fill it with your Holy Spirit of wisdom, power, and courage as we go down this road. Father, we asking we're asking for a hedge of protection uh, around us, Father, in this time of pandemic. Around us, who even have gotten our vaccinations, our boosters, we we. Um, we wear our mask and we uh, separate and uh, distance and all that. And even those who don't do all that don't believe in it, Father. And we just ask for mercy on them too, Father, as we move down the road. So thank you, Father. Thank and you, we, Lord. We, 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 we just appreciate all that you've done for us, Father. And may your word go on. May it keep moving on to narrow that gap between you and your people. In the name of Christ, we pray. Amen. Amen. Standing in the gap, standing for Jesus. Standing in the gap for family and friends. Standing in the gap. One love for all, so we all can make it in. Standing in the gap, standing for Jesus. Standing in the gap for family and friends. Standing in the gap, one love for all, so we all can make it in. Studying to show ourselves approved. Rightly to find the word of truth Increasing our faith to envision our freedom So we all can glorify our God Standing in the gap, standing for Jesus Standing in the gap for family and friends Standing in the gap one love for all, so we all can make it in, make it in, make it in, make it in. 
Want to hear him say good, good and faithful servant Want to hear him say enter to the joy of the Lord Want to hear him say good, good and faithful servant Want to hear him say enter to the joy of the Lord Want to hear him say good, good and faithful servant Want to hear him say enter to the joy of the Lord Want to hear him say good, good and faithful servant Want to hear him say enter to the joy of the Lord Want to hear him say good, good and faithful servant Want to hear him say enter to the joy of the Lord Want to hear him say good and good and faithful servant Want to hear him say enter to the joy of the Lord Joy of the Lord, Lord, joy of the Lord, of the Lord.